So it's a great pleasure to give a talk today and I'm going to use the next half an hour or so to provide an overview of some of our work in pathogen genomics using genomes to track pathogens in space and in time, going from the very old to the really much more recent and often making use of quite unusual genomic resources. And I'll start by really pointing out the, the fairly obvious observation that the reason we're online today rather than in person is because of the emergence of a zoonotic disease. So the host jump of the SARS-CoV-2 virus responsible for COVID-19 into the human population, giving rise to the ongoing pandemic. But COVID-19 is just one of very many zoonotic diseases. And I've got here a, a timeline with rough estimates of human population sizes. We can explore in this timeline some of the estimated ages of emergence of, of major infectious diseases. So some have been with us um, for a very long time, such as tuberculosis, hepatitis B and, and plague, whereas others are much more recent emergences. And the timing of these events and the original zoonotic reservoirs remain unclear in many, if really not most of these cases. And that's despite the fact that for many of these pathogens, um, there are really many thousands of genomes available from modern samples. So on this slide, TB and malaria are noticeable examples where we have very dense sampling of, of modern data. So when it comes to infectious disease genomics on the whole, we're quite simply working with a recent and a shallow depth of sampling. Now, one solution is to generate pathogen genomes from the past, making use of diverse sources of, of ancient biomolecules. And these could range from archeological remains through to pathology collections or museum samples. At the same time, our understanding of current disease outbreaks and, and even pandemics is increasingly moving to essentially real time, allowing us to track the evolution of new pathogens accompanied by very rich epidemiological data. And so both a past and, and present approach to pathogen genomics is opening up um, very many new opportunities and, and new insights. So I'm going to discuss sort of both of these strategies in today's talk, hence the title, Something Old and Something New. And starting with something old, and it's a fundamental interest to understand when, where, and how path pathogens that affect us um, first emerged. And this tells us not only sort of how long the selective forces of pathogen evolution and host immunity have been interacting with each other, but also what the landscape of diversity must have been or might have been like in the past. For instance, the, the sort of presence of extinct lineages, the emergence of, say, host adaptive traits, and importantly, what was going on in, in pathogen genomes pre the widespread use of therapeutics, such as antibiotics, antimalarials, or, or vaccines. And in almost every case, when we're able to obtain genomic data from past disease agents, um, we push back our knowledge on the age of when these agents last shared a common ancestor, how long they might have been infecting us, how long they've been evolving and adapting in, in tandem with, with us, their, their human hosts. Now, some recent good examples of this are the variola virus responsible for smallpox, which was thought to have emerged in, in humans in, say, the 16th to 17th century, whereas a recent paper identified the presence of this virus in, in 13 um, ancient human remains, pushing back the age of emergence by around about a thousand years. And another very striking and, and recent example is measles, which is thought to have jumped into human hosts around the, the 9th century or so, but a genome generated from a lung pathology sample dating to, to 1912 resulted in pushing back the divergence of measles from um, rinderpest, potentially as far back as sort of 6 BCE, so a much more ancient emergence of measles. And this figure flags some significant human infectious diseases that are really impacted human populations. But of course, there are many, many other pathogens with, with very different life histories. And perhaps some of the most intriguing of those are those which have caused or which cause very common infections that are highly prevalent in children and generally characterized by quite low um, virulence. And I'm flagging just two real examples here, adenoviruses and, and herpes viruses. And for some, like herpes virus, this low virulence can sort of manifest as, as latent infections with the virus evolving um, along with its host. And these sort of traits have led some to hypothesize that these viruses have, may have associated with humans for really a very long periods of time, perhaps co-diverging with, with humans as a species. And additionally, some of the properties of viruses like these, these double-stranded DNA viruses, is that they readily recombine. They typically today exhibit very low levels of geographic structure in, in modern data. And this can limit our ability to make inferences about transmission patterns that underlie current distributions, let alone go about addressing some of the hypotheses as to, the, to their relationships with, with, with us in the, in the very deep past. 
And I mentioned these uh, species in particular as I was, uh, I was involved in some work where we identified the presence of these viruses in DNA sequencing reads obtained from the milk teeth of two early human children dating to around 31,000 years ago, sampled at the archaeological site of Yana in, in northeastern Siberia. And those of you who follow sort of human ancient DNA research will recognize that these are the two unrelated children which yielded very high coverage human genomes, helping to uncover patterns of human migrations over the Pleistocene period in, in this region of the world. But in and amongst these sequencing reads from, from these two children were also reads that we could assign to four species of, of herpes virus at quite low coverage. But also we were able to authenticate two nearly complete genomes of species of adenovirus called human adenovirus C. Now, uh, one of these genomes was with quite good coverage, so about 5.2x over the reference genome here, and the other was a bit lower at just over 1x. But the coverage, as you can see, is fairly even. We could validate that these genomes were genuinely um, ancient or very ancient, and we could strongly assign these genomes to adenovirus C rather than any other adenovirus species. So these genomes really provide direct evidence of the presence of these viruses in human populations, at least since the Pleistocene, and also provide, in this case, some of the earliest direct evidence of, of human virus um, interactions. And so one question when we have ancient genomes or very ancient genomes like these is where do they fit in in terms of sort of modern diversity? So we can compare these two genomes from, from uh, from these children to the kind of modern diversity of human adenovirus C, which is today classified into six distinct genotypes, so genotypes one and two being most commonly associated to in infections in immunocompromised individuals. So here we have the average nucleotide identity as you sort of move in a sliding window along the adenovirus C genome, and this includes over its sort of key shared and major capsid genes. So we have the, the L2 gene or penton, which is found at sort of the base of the viral capsid, um, the L3 or hexon protein, which builds much of the sort of main body of the virus. And then right at the end here, the, the fiber protein, which you can see here, which forms these protrusions from the capsid and interacts with sort of the host receptors. And these regions are typically used today for modern genotyping. They exhibit very high linkage disequilibrium, while the remainder of the genome is sort of somewhat freely recombining. So we can sort of move along and assess the distributions for our high coverage and lower coverage genome. And you can see for the higher coverage as we go along that there's um, a higher um, matching or affinity to um, adenovirus genotype C2 or, or 2. And then for the slightly lower coverage genome, you can see we've got this close matching along the dark blue, uh, which corresponds to genotype 1. And so we don't just have two very old examples of ancient adenovirus C infections, but also infections which very likely derive from these two diverse genotypes. And that suggests that these sort of different genotypes, which we see in circulation today, must have diversified from each other sort of well preceding the time of our samples 31,000 years ago. This is also highlighting that these linked capsid genes, which are used as genotypic markers today, have also existed for, for quite some time, suggesting a strong sort of functional role between this hexon fiber and prenton proteins. And so we can finally compare our, our two um, very ancient genomes into the landscape of the diversity of modern um, adenovirus C. In this, in this case, there's about 85 genomes or so here and provide a cursory estimate of, of quite how old um, some of these relationships might be. Now, as I mentioned, adenoviruses are freely recombining over these non-capsid genes. And so we applied quite a stringent approach uh, to filter out sort of putative recombinant chunks in the genome, phylogenetically incongruent sites or homoplasies. And also given many of these modern adenovirus genomes are quite heavily passaged, we also excluded singleton positions. And this left us with a short but clonal and measurably evolving alignment. And using that alignment and the times of sample collection, we can estimate the timings or the possible timings of the common ancestor of, of all of the human adenovirus C. And we date that to around about 500 to 1,000 or so, um, 100,000 or so years ago. And that's really very old. And it's an also an intriguing uh, time estimate. So if we think of the split time of the ancestors of, of Homo sapiens from our archaic cousins, the Neanderthals and Denisovans were sort of looking at around about 550 to 700,000 years ago. So seeing an emergence that we're sort of dating for this virus around this time period is maybe quite consistent with a species co-divergence scenario, but also suggests that other species of adenovirus may well have been originating within our hominin ancestors. 
Now, what's quite interesting is if we then look at what we estimate for the emergence of a kind of modern diversity, so the modern uh, genotypes, you can see that that is really um, much more recent if we're thinking along these kind of um, ancient time scales. And we estimate really that modern diversity appeared within the last 70,000 or so years. And so this corresponds or coincides quite well with our knowledge of, of the out of Africa migrations of modern humans. And it may be that we had divergent lineages of human adenovirus C that were being spread out of Africa with the, the migrations of, of modern humans. So a, a plausible and intriguing alternative could be a cross species transfer from archaic humans who modern humans met as they sort of entered Eurasia around this time period. And such a scenario is also being proposed for, for other viruses, including HPV. And more and older genomes will certainly help to increase the resolution of the, the timing estimates on this tree and, and hopefully help to disentangle the, these two hypotheses. And I should highlight that this is work that's being led by Martin Sikora in Copenhagen and, and also Sophie Holtzman-Nielsen, who came and did a placement with us at, at UCL Genetics Institute. And so this work really is consistent with a very ancient association and divergence of adenoviruses. These are really very old and we can both directly observe these in, in DNA sequencing reads from archaeological remains, but also use computational methods to estimate the timings of origins and, and divergence events. So um, I think this is it's very exciting. We're quite possibly only just scratching the surface on the limit of the oldest human pathogen genomes that we're, that we're going to be able to obtain. And I'm sure that's going to yield even a deeper time periods of insights. Now with um, adenovirus C, we found that the kind of ancient diversity back 31,000 years ago was actually falling into the diversity that we see in existing lineages that we sample today. But that of course may not always be true, even in more recent times. And we can use genomic data from past specimens to explore the diversity that exists in lineages that we've now lost. And um, a very good example is if we think about um, malarial parasites. And so today, moving to malaria, we have a fairly good understanding of the prevalence and distribution of major human associated plasmodium parasites. That's really been aided by initiatives such as the Malaria Atlas project, which I'm sort of highlighting here. You can see that now genus plasmodium, particularly for falciparum and vivax, the two major human associated plasmodiums, is really restricted to tropical and subtropical latitudes. However, until really quite recently, malaria was present across Europe, spanning from Britain, the Mediterranean, and all the way through into um, kind of European Russia. Now, malaria was eradicated from all European countries during sort of the second half of the 20th century, with Spain in particular being one of the, the last footholds from which the kind of final declaration of eradication was in 1964. But you can see looking at this sort of lost diversity of European malarial parasites, that this is quite possibly limiting our ability to track modern dispersal events of this sort of major pathogen, but also to understand the evolution of this pathogen as a whole. And I think this is a good example of really the possible sources of, of ancient biomolecules, which I know we'll be discussing during this conference. Not only can we have obtained past genomes or past pathogen genomes from archaeological remains, but there's plenty of other resources too for instance, directly from past collections of clinical samples. Now, recently, a set of slides with, with blood slains of, of malaria affected people was, was identified in a local medical collection um, in Ebro Delta in Spain. And these were blood stains or bloods taken from patients who were predominantly local people in the region between 1942 and 1944, who were working in, in the Ebro rice fields and had no history of international travel. And as part of an international collaboration with the Institute of Evolutionary Biology and the, the Section for Evolutionary Genomics at the University of Copenhagen, we generated shotgun alumina sequence data from, from these four archival blood slides and obtained and authenticated a partial plasmodium falciparum genome and, and a, a reasonably high or a kind of reasonable coverage plasmodium vivax genome. And of course, one major advantage of, of analyzing genomic data from materials such as these slides is often you have a very good idea that the pathogen is there. You might even have the date written on the slides as in this case. And so for instance, here, we could actually see the parasites under the microscope. So I'm just gonna go forward and talk about some of the inferences we could make using this 1.4 X plasmodium vivax genome. And the first question is quite simply, where does eradicated vivax from the 1940s fit in with our understanding of the modern landscape of vivax malaria that we have in circulation now? And so we compiled a data set of um, around about 300 or so genomes or 350 genomes sampled across really the breadth of the distribution um, today. 
And we can sort of collapse the modern diversity into a couple of dimensions using principal components analysis. And you can see that there's really quite strong population structure. So here we have vivax in, in Oceania and Australia. Uh, here we have um, kind of Asia and, and Southeast Asia, India, and then the, the Americas here. And quite simply, we can ask, well, where does our European, so this eradicated sample, fall into this diversity? And we found it sits around about here. So we have the, the um, diversity we observe in, in, a, in this eradicated plasmodium vivax sitting on an axis of variation, which is stretching out to include a strain sample from Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and also Peru. So this is really highlighting that of all the modern diversity we have, this eradicated lineage is sitting closest to those currently in the Americas. And this is a relationship that we could support using sort of model-based clustering, correlated patterns of, of drift, so F statistics, and, and also chromosome painting, looking at haplotype sharing patterns. Now, given we have a robust relationship of this eradicated lineage to extinct diversity in, in the Americas, we can ask, well, where does this derive from? We've seen that many think, or it's widely thought, that malaria is really very, very old. So is the split between the Americas and Europe something that's also very old? Perhaps it relates to the initial peopling of the Americas um, maybe 15,000 years ago, or is it instead something um, that happened much more recently or a split that happened more recently? And again, we can approach this using calibration methods. And, and here's a phylogeny of sort of representative samples from the Americas and Europe, plus um, Asia and Southeast Asian samples from the 1950s and 1960s, and, and use this data to calibrate the tree over a measurably evolving alignment. And we're particularly interested in, in, in this node, so the age of the split between Europe and the Americas. And so we applied Bayesian uh, tip dating analysis, and we're able to estimate that this split time um, dates to around about the 15th century with quite a large confidence interval. And then what, what we did, all of our estimates suggested something much more recent than during the initial, initial peoplings of the Americas. And of course, this date of divergence and time period is highly consistent with or concordant with the colonial period, which we know was responsible for the spread and dissemination of ma many major infectious diseases. And our results sort of point to the fact that Plasmodium vivax may, may also have been one of them. But aside from these historic and deep dispersals, this eradicated genome also offers further opportunities. So here we have a genome that's confidently dated to the 1940s, which is predating the use of most modern antimalarials. So we can screen along the genome for, for this eradicated lineage and ask, well, do we see any variants that are today associated with uh, resistance to antimalarial drugs? And in the vast majority of cases, we identified that we had the sort of ancestral allele in, in these sites, but this was not ubiquitously true. So we did identify resistant variants associated today with resistance to sulfadoxine and chloroquine, both predating their use. And this suggests some potential for, for standing variation in antimalarial resistance genes prior to the antibiotic era. And so I think this work really highlights the value of old medical collections and pathology collections, of which there are very many, um, for the generation of past genomic data and really offers opportunities to observe pathogen evolution through the 20th century. And I'm currently just sort of trying to build up our own collections through collaborations with curators and public health archivists. So I mention this here because if you're interested or you know of possible collections, then um, I'd really love to hear from you. And so I think this studies on, on malaria gives a really good example of, of past observations and how we can use these to make inferences of associations and transmissions, which really, particularly in the case of, of um, plasmodium and also adenovirus C, might be lost using modern data of loan, alone. But of course, that doesn't um, negate the real value of um, dense sampling and, and modern data. And this really brings me to the something new of this talk. And as with many working in infectious disease genomics, some of my work has diverted to focusing on the novel coronavirus, the severe acute respiratory coronavirus 2, or uh, SARS-CoV-2, the agent of the ongoing pandemic. And um, I wanted to touch on some of the observations we've been able to make using this really new um, pathogen and, and also a new resource. But first, I should start by highlighting that while SARS-CoV-2 is a new addition to our suite of human pathogens, it is, of course, of course, one of really very many coronaviruses which have been circulating for what is estimated to be a really long time. So I'm just highlighting some of the diversity here. This is a core genome phylogeny across the whole coronavirus family. Uh, you can see the four genre uh, highlighted in colours. And then around the rim, I've just sort of um, annotated the host from which these genomes were identified. 
So you can already see just looking at these little um, icons around the tree that these are viruses with exceedingly large host ranges. They're found in all kinds of species. And of course, this includes us. So as well as SARS-CoV-2, there are six further coronaviruses known to infect humans. So we have SARS-CoV-1 here and, and MERS, which are responsible for fairly recent epidemics and, and can be cause quite severe or very severe respiratory symptoms. But four other species also of endemic human coronaviruses, so AC43, HKU1, NL63 and 229E. And I highlight these as these are, are really endemic circulating coronaviruses and they're responsible for maybe 15 to 30% to of common colds. And so whilst of course there's endless speculation on, on the origins of SARS-CoV-2, the age and the zoonotic reservoirs of some of these other common cold coronaviruses and, and other coronaviruses remain really quite poorly resolved. Now, one of the themes of this conference is the analysis of ancient biomolecules, often from unusual sources. And whilst it's clearly not ancient, ancient um, in many ways, the genomic data sets of SARS-CoV-2 are amongst the, the most unusual. It's really an extraordinary sample to be working on. So I'm showing here a timeline of the, the number of uploads of genomic data to GISAID, which is a pretty amazing um, repository where people have been generating and sharing data um, since the first SARS-CoV-2 genome was released around about um, 14 months or so now. And it's worth putting this into perspective. So if we think back to the first epidemic for which genetic sequencing data was really available in close to real time, this was influenza A H1N1 or, or swine flu back in 2009. Now, a paper published then, about two months after the declaration of the pandemic, analysed 11 partial genomes. And a decade or so later, here we are in the COVID-19 pandemic, and um, at the same stage, well over 10,000 whole genomes had been generated. So um, it's really quite an extraordinary resource. And you can see from this timeline that within sort of nine months, we reached 100,000 genomes. And, and today, when I last checked, we're well over 450,000 genomes which are available. So this is really allowing us to track um, pandemic viral lineages in, in really close to real time. And this is the, the current diversity of SARS-CoV-2 as a phylogeny, and, and this now conclude, um, includes sort of over 400,000 genomes or tips in this tree. So it really is an enormous data set. And we're able to, or, be, or we've been able to watch diversity accumulate as the pandemic has gone on. So I'm just sort of filling in the tips on this tree as we, we go through various stages of the pandemic. And, Certainly in the early days, it was very clear that there were many, many thousands of introductions, many transmission lineages in many regions of the world. So some very nice work by, by Louis Duplessis and, and colleagues early in the, the pandemic identified well over a thousand introductions into the UK and, and really in any places where we have dense amounts of sequencing data, we see the same thing. So with lockdowns and interventions, local population structure has been emerging. And I think you can sort of see that on this, this video as we have and the emergence of more geographically structured populations. And I guess looking at that animation, it really appears like there's loads of diversity. But actually, if I represent this instead as a, a rectangular tree, and here I've shown the distance from the root of the tree on the x-axis, you can see that diversity is still um, very low. This is a young virus. At, at the moment, there is no SARS-CoV-2 genome that has more than, say, 50 mutations different from, from the reference at this stage. And this is quite a large virus. The genome is about 30 KB in length. So you can see that this isn't much variability. It's quite a homogenous population. And in fact, um, sort of even now, every, every SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to each other. And there are in, um, many, many exact duplicate genomes in SARS-CoV-2 data sets. But this opens up some questions over the rate of mutation in SARS-CoV-2. How long has it taken for us to get to sort of 50 or so mutations away from the reference? We can again calibrate this phylogenetic tree and consider really the time period over which all of these sequences might share a common ancestor. And so this is just a, a simple regression over this tree on the left, and this allows us to estimate a rate of accumulation of mutations of maybe 25 to at most 28 mutations per year. So this works out at quite a slow rate of evolution for a virus at about T mutations per month, which is about half that we see in say influenza. Of course, we can also do this more formally. And, and we did this um, uh, sort of earlier on in the pandemic over 7,600 genomes in sort of what feels like a, a long time ago now. And we're able to estimate that the rate quite similar to this, but also the time to the most recent common ancestor to around about the sort of latter half of 2019. And we estimate this to be, you know, as early as October through to sort of early December. 
And this sort of time window or time window that we can estimate from the phylogeny also corresponds to the likely timing of the original host jump of SARS-CoV-2 from a zoonotic reservoir into human circulation. And potentially, you know, there's many possible reservoirs that the bats have been put forward as a strong candidate as there's very large reservoirs of and the subgenus of, of coronavirus or beta coronavirus to which SARS-CoV-2 belongs in bats. Um, but it's quite plausible that we have one or several intermediate hosts that are, that are yet to be identified. And of course, SARS-CoV-2 has been through subsequent host jumps and perhaps most famously from humans into minks, something which again we know has, has occurred independently multiple times. Now, following a host jump, there is likely to be or need to be some degree of adaptation of a pathogen to transmit well in its new host. And some of the sort of strongest candidates for adaptation are those mutations, so those changes in the virus that keep happening that have emerged repeatedly and, and independently of the evolutionary history of the virus. And I'm flagging an example here, which is a mutation called 501Y, which is a mutation in the coronavirus spike protein found in all the lineages which have been flagged as of concern at, at the moment, including the, the lineage that was first detected within the UK. And you can see that we have a sort of the repeat emergence of this mutation independent of the evolutionary tree. And can we use independent emergences of mutations? We, we suspect they may be more likely to be adaptive to then estimate the impact of any given mutation on, on SARS-CoV-2. Now for a virus, really its fitness or transmission fitness can be considered as a proxy for the overall fitness. And this um, allows transmission fitness to be estimated using very densely sampled phylogenetic trees such as this one as the relative fractions of descendants produced by ancestral genotypes. And so as an, as an example here, we have a red um, homoplasic or um, mutation which has evolved more than once. And we can see that compared to a parental node, um, we have a, a number of offspring or more offspring carrying this mutation compared to those that don't. And so um, this sort of follows an in, a mutation that positively affects the pathogen's transmission fitness should be represented in proportionally more descendants. And so um, in some, some fairly recent work, we devised a formal statistic to um, estimate these ratios, which we called the ratio of homoplasic offspring or ROHO scores across um, every possible recurrent mutation within um, the very large SARS-CoV-2 alignments. And you can find out more details sort of within this, this paper. And so we first applied this statistic to sort of the pandemic lineages current to the end of August 2020, which is about 50,000 genomes and um, really any any uh, over representation of offspring increasing transmission will result in in positive scores here and, and a decrease of the suggested decrease in fitness with a, a roundabout zero suggesting mutual evolution. And at this point in the pandemic, we really could identify no significant deviation from what we'd expect under a neutral model, suggesting most of those mutations that have been accumulating, you know, every two or so a month have really weren't making um, a big difference in terms of bio, the bio, kind of transmission fitness of the virus. Our latest run is now on uh, 400,000 genomes. There's been some scalability challenges for sure. This is a very large data set and a large um, tree. Um, and now we represent the, the presentation or the, the positivity and negative, the negativity of these ROHO scores as a, as a ring on a, a sort of circular plot. And I'm just going to show some of our very latest results, which we have the, the scores um, shown around this, this ring here, and then the density of these scores on, on the inner ring. And what we're seeing now is some um, deviation from what we might expect under a fully neutral model. And in particular, we see pockets of the genome, which we score as tending to increase fitness, in particular high density of positive scores at the early part of the coronavirus spike protein, and also um, a density of sort of positive um, scores in the, the middle of the nuclear capsid protein. And we also observed some quite interesting properties in this, these scores, particularly on this very large data set now, in particular, a, a sort of skew towards more negative scores. So you can see here the distribution of, of our ROHO scores moving away from, from zero. And this is consistent with the accumulation of sort of weakly deleterious mutations. At the same time, we have the presence of, of known sort of functional and non-synonymous changes occurring in the upper tails of the distribution. And these are tending towards increasing the transmission fitness. And we often find that some of these high scoring positions are linked to other sites of, of relevance in the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And there really seems to be increasing evidence for epistatic effects in this particular RNA virus. So we're currently, and this is very much work in progress, developing a score which can be applied to particular combinations of mutations, but also to quantify the, the relative transmission fitness of, of lineages of concern. 
It's also quite intriguing that it's taken this period of time for us to identify really strong adaptive changes in, in SARS-CoV-2. And this may well be another case where older sampling is going to help us understand some of those initial adaptive changes which were required for the successful sort of human to human transmission of SARS-CoV-2. It's quite possible that by the time we started sequencing SARS-CoV-2 as a virus that we'd missed some of that initial early evolution. So SARS-CoV-2 is truly something new in terms of the host jump into the human population. But it also sort of creates new challenges. This is a very large data set. Um, how do we go about really tracking diversity in real time? Um, and, and how can we use that, that knowledge to, to, inference, to influence, for example, pandemic response? It's also sort of illustrative of how we can use genomic sequencing data to track host jumps, to track transmission, and also to try and quantify adaptive changes, perhaps even as they're arising. So in summary, this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through space and, and time, and I, I hope I've kept you with me. I wanted to really just highlight some of the, the major new opportunities in infectious disease genomics, really stressing that goes from the retrieval of very old viruses of very ancient emergencies, such as adenovirus, um, through to the use of, sort of clinical collections to source genomic data from eradicated lineages, such as European um, malaria, which really gives new opportunities to, to uncover past transmission events. And finally, to the analysis of SARS-CoV-2 data sets, and really just to highlight that it's a very exciting time for genomic epidemiology of, of both um, the past, but also um, of the present. So this, of course, has been work done with, with very many people, and I've tried to highlight everybody on, on this slide, and in particular those working on, on adenovirus C, um, and Sophie, who worked closely with us, and also Charlotte, who's brought real expertise in virology, which I think is really important as a computational biologist to be teaming up with those who have real expertise on the, the biology of the organism in question. Our malaria work, which really the generation of the data was um, that was really achieved thanks to Christian Caro and, and Tom Gilbert, who I know you'll hear from, from later in, in the conference. And these were studies that I worked jointly and very closely with Pierre Galibert and Tony Zadias and were, were led by Carla Zalueza Fox. And finally, to, to SARS-CoV-2, really this work is, is firstly thanks to huge data sharing initiatives such as CogUK and GISAID, um, a team that have worked really very hard over the past year. And I just wanted to particularly highlight Damien Richard, who's implemented the ROHO scoring pipeline, and, and Francois Ballou, who I've worked with jointly in all of these studies. And I also should thank, to, thank the, the organisers and for the, for the great invitation to talk to you today. And um, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference. So thank you very much.